Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 235 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Matthew Dix about storytelling. Today's podcast is brought to you by Podium, Text Expander, and Ruby Receptionist. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So Matthew Dix is the author of a great book called Storyworthy about how telling stories can help improve your business in a variety of ways. He's also the guest of this month's Lawyerist Book Club in our Insider Facebook group. If you want to follow along, read along with the book and enter in some discussion with our team there. And all of our labsters got the book, right? We sent them yeah, a present. Yeah, we sent a free surprise copy, which surprised and confused many of them. <laughs> So we'll probably have to announce those surprises a little better or differently next time. It happens that this week on Lawyerist in our Lens video and new content on the website, the theme of the week is managing people. And I thought it is not a direct correlation, but there's some really interesting opportunities to adapt the storytelling method that Matthew Dix is going to talk about to the concepts of managing your team and your business. Yeah, I think while I was talking with Matt, I was thinking about this kernel of an idea, but I, I think businesses are kind of a story that we tell ourselves, right? Or at least we tell ourselves a story about our business, why it exists, what the transformation the business is trying to make in the world is going to be, or in your personal life, whatever. And and I think to a certain extent, managing people is getting everybody telling the same story about the company and about their roles in it and understanding their parts in the story. I don't think you can mechanically apply that, but I think getting better at storytelling might have the side effect of getting you better at figuring out how to talk about mission and vision and values in your company, which you can then apply to management and hiring and firing and maybe make those things easier. Yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't think there's anything mechanical about it, but I think it's directly applicable. I think both in the concept of building a brand for your company, your brand is, is a story. the, the yeah. story of the work you do in the world and how it impacts your customers and the marketplace. And similarly, as a leader of your law firm, painting a clear vision for your team around why you're doing what you're doing and where you're headed is an act of storytelling. Um, to be able to forecast a future and paint a clear picture of what the future looks like is absolutely constructing a story. So to learn more about storytelling, here's my conversation with Matt. Hi, my name is Matthew Dix. I am a father and a husband, and my wife thinks that's important, and so do my kids. Uh, when I'm not husbanding and fathering, I am a novelist. I write novels for adults and upcoming uh, my first children's novel. I'm an elementary school teacher for the last 21 years. I teach fifth grade in West Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm a storyteller. I stand on stages now all over the world and tell true personal stories about my life. I teach storytelling quite extensively now to just about every kind of person you could imagine. Just in the past month, I guess, I have been on the campus of universities. I've worked with ministers and rabbis. I've worked with companies, large and small, nonprofits. Uh, I worked with Native Americans in Canada, teaching them how to tell stories, which <laughs> it's amazing. Did that feel presumptuous? Like that's a storytelling culture, right? I agree. Uh, it was... Um, <laughs> It was a Mohawk tribe, and it was a group of people who were learning the Mohawk language for the first time. And the person running the program essentially wanted them to tell better stories so that they could practice using the language that they were acquiring. Yeah. So it was odd. But, you know, as my wife says, now that I work with people in storytelling, it's sort of like every day it's a new and amazing person either calling or sending an email asking for help. And so the list of people who recognize the value of storytelling is becoming endless. So I do all those things. I'm also a wedding DJ. I, think I heard life coaching in there too. I do a lot of life coaching. Yeah, people come to me for storytelling coaching and what it turns into is, oh, you just need help with your life, not with <laughs> storytelling. So that became a thing. I actually substitute minister now at churches. When the minister or the, the rabbi goes on vacation, I fill in. So 
I, I have a lot of hats. And yeah, and I is, like is one of them like your predominant hat? Like, are you a school teacher first or a storyteller first? Or That's a really hard question. I play a lot of golf and oftentimes there's a new person on the golf course with us, a fourth that we pick up. And when they ask me, what do you do for a living? I always think, well, <laughs> the school teacher job is the one that forces me to go to a place yeah. on a given day. But my publishing career is probably more profitable than my teaching career. <laughs> but the thing that I sort of am known for the most, oddly, is now becoming my storytelling. So it's those three prongs that are my primary professions. But, you know, my wife says when I retire someday, I will still have nine other jobs to retire from. So, so there's a lot of things going on. Yeah. We're here to talk about storytelling, and I absolutely want to get to that. I listened to your book as an audiobook. It was nice that you read it so that now I'm already familiar with you. I feel like we've been talking for days. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of those one-sided relationships <laughs> yeah. where people meet me and they feel they know everything about me before I even know their name. And you, you kind of start out the book by selling storytelling as learning how to tell better stories is a useful skill across the board. And maybe it's not obvious what it has to do with life coaching, but I, I've heard people say that, you know, your life is in many ways a story you tell yourself. And so I guess that kind of makes sense uh, about how those things have come together. How, though, when you think about not storytelling for winning social points or meeting someone, when you think about storytelling in business, how does that translate? Well, whatever your business is, you're attempting to communicate to clients, to consumers, Somebody in the world, if you own a business, you're trying to reach or essentially trying to get their money or their attention or their time. And what people are beginning to discover and what they've already discovered is that everyone who you sort of employ in your company, they're already storytellers. They're just mm -hmm. terrible storytellers. Yeah. They've just been doing it poorly for all their lives. But it's a skill they already possess that only needs to be refined. So you don't have to buy a new building, purchase a new software program. You don't have to hire new people. You can just take the people who you have and teach them to do the thing that they're already doing better. And because it's storytelling and because it has such a social impact as well, the buy-in tends to be enormous because we're not asking them to learn a program that they can only operate between nine and five and only for the purpose of you know working in their company. I go into these businesses and I tell them, I'm going to teach you something that will help you in your dating life. It will help you hmm. make new friends. It'll help you deal with your in-laws better. It'll just make people like you more. And by the way, it will also help you pursue whatever you have in business, whether you're a salesperson or whether you're working with clients, you know, trying to help them understand what your purpose is or what your mission is. It's all about communication. And the more effective you are at communicating, the better you are. My favorite story about this is I went to Brazil like three years ago and I was working with an engineering firm. And the CEO of the firm told me that he now hires bad engineers who can speak and write well hmm. because he knows how to turn bad engineers into good ones. But he has no idea what to do with all of the people coming out of college who can't write effectively communicate effectively or sort of stand in front of people and convey a message by making eye contact and being interesting and entertaining and informative. And that struck me, just the idea that we're going to now be hiring people who are bad at the skill we need right? because they have a, another skill that seems to be in short supply these days. That strikes me a lot. Obviously, lawyering is all about communication and both written and verbal. And lots of lawyers think they are good at this and in reality could use work. I mean, we spend law school reading and writing and communicating, but most lawyers don't learn how to be good writers until afterwards in, in a persuasive sense. And most lawyers think they have are full of interesting stories. But honestly, I dread cocktails with lawyers because all I hear about is war stories. In your book, you present a series of rules for things like travel stories and commencement speeches and drinking stories. And I, I think they're great. And I'm wondering if on the fly, maybe we could come up with some rules for how lawyers can do a better job of telling stories about lawyering. Well, I mean, essentially what it comes down to when you're telling a story, if you're telling a good story, is you're talking about a moment for yourself that is reflective of either a transformation or a realization. It's a moment where you have fundamentally changed in some way. Those war stories, I get them as a teacher all the time as well. Mm -hmm. They tend to be, hey, here's a crazy thing that happened. Right. And that's not really a story. You know, that's sort of an amusing anecdote that is quickly forgotten and often unwanted. You know, <laughs> but if you work with an actual client as an attorney and through the process of 
helping someone or not helping someone through the process of your job, you fundamentally change in some significant way. Then we sort of have a story. And that might be worth telling as opposed to the, hey, here's a crazy thing that happened. Because I suspect that whatever job you do, you always have a here's a crazy thing that happened story. But they're just they're forgettable. Like I said, they're unwanted. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe there are good luring stories. We have lots of attorneys in our show. You know, I recently had an attorney who told the story of how he was prosecuting the case, a murder case against a man who during the course of the case, he discovered that man had saved his life by calling off a hit on the attorney. Oh. <laughs> now that's a story because yeah. he suddenly had a transformation in the terms in terms of the way he looked at this man who he was prosecuting. He was prosecuting a man who had saved his life 10 years before. And in a weird way. That, yeah. <laughs> right. And and that transformation is real that now you understand the attorney better. He is able to share a part of his heart and mind with you as opposed to here's a crazy thing that happened. I have a number of follow up thoughts because you really say that storytelling is really about that five seconds, right? There's a five second thing that happens or three or seven where that transformation changes. And that's really what you're telling a story about. Yeah, I really believe that most of the time when we shift in some fundamental way, when we suddenly view the world or ourselves or our spouse or our colleague in a new way, it really does happen almost immediately. I think there's a lot of things that lead to that moment, and that mm -hmm. is part of the story. But what you're shooting at is the moment where at one point in my life, I thought one thing, and then the next moment, I thought something entirely different. Or mm -hmm. at one point in my life, I was one kind of a person, and then the next moment, I was a different kind of person. That's the moment we're looking for. And that's Ideally, what people really want when it comes to storytelling anyway, they want to know that there was a moment that, you know, that is the drama of life is that singular moment. Watch movies. It's the same way. You know, we, we don't watch change slowly happen over time. We sort of recognize that oftentimes these things are immediate. And that's what makes a story. That's what we should look for as storytellers. As I was reading your book, I was reflecting on this sort of nascent idea that I've had about networking and the fact that networking is so much easier when you know you have something to talk about that is going to be interesting. Like I enjoy winter camping and I can always get a good 30 minutes of questions from other people about this. But in listening to your book, I think that it's not the winter camping because that's actually, if all I'm doing is talking about that, it's the travel story. And I think what it is, is that there's a way I talk about it where there is a five second thing. And listening to your book made me reflect on it. And I could probably make that a much better story that actually gets me way more than 30 minutes of interest out of people around me if I think more about it. But also, I think I am way less afraid of networking because I know I have something people will be interested in talking about with me. And I bet for I don't know, maybe for you walking into a room full of strangers where you're meant to meet them and talk with them is easier because you have storytelling and you have stories to tell. And it probably makes things a little bit easier. It really does. You know, and if you commit yourself to the craft, you quickly can assemble a horde of stories. You know, it is very rare that someone is speaking to me and telling me something about their life or telling a story that I am not triggered to have a story to follow their story. It's, mm -hmm. it's very easy for me to do that. And so I'm never nervous when I meet new people. I'm excited about it. I'm a good listener, too. I've really trained myself to speak last. Yeah. And so wherever I am, I'm trying to be the absolute last person who opens their mouth because I want to assemble as much information as possible. So when I do start speaking, whether I'm going to tell a story or an anecdote or whatever I'm going to say, I can be the most entertaining and compelling because I can use the information that I've gathered to guarantee that the thing I'm going to say is going to be of some interest to the people listening. Yeah. And obviously you don't want to create the perception that you're just waiting your turn to talk. <laughs> no, I mean, when I say I'm the last person to speak, I can ask clarifying questions. I mm -hmm. can invite people to tell stories. You know, I've been teaching for 21 years in an elementary school. So almost always I am in a room filled only with women. And I actually went to an all women university. Mm -hmm. And so spending most of my life in the company of women has absolutely taught me that if you're the one man in the room, nobody wants you talking for <laughs> nobody wants you talking at all. <laughs> yeah, or at all. And so I've really developed a good skill in terms of listening. But it's important as a storyteller to be a great listener because it really does assist you in terms of what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. And I do think it makes me more effective. Yeah. I'm also just terribly arrogant. And I assume that whatever I'm going to say <laughs> is going to be interesting. So I never have that fear. 
Now that's just me. <laughs> oh, you know, it might be endemic to our profession, but maybe not. <laughs> we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and we come back. I want to pivot to talk about or at least organize some of your basic tips for better storytelling. So we'll be right back. Drip, drip. Drip, hear that? It's your office's online reviews. Kind of slow, huh? Not exactly the gush of praise you were hoping for when you set up your account on that review site. But why? After all, your best clients love you. They say it all the time, just not online. And that's too bad. Because your word may be your bond, but your client's words, well, they're your best sales tool. And these days, a star rating can make the difference between very interested and running for the hills. Podium knows how important reviews are to your law office. That's why they built a great online review platform, making it simpler than ever to get a five-star rating you know you deserve. Businesses see an average 6% increase in revenue from reviews thanks to Podium. More than just a friendly reminder, Podium sends clients straight to the review sites you care about most with built-in analytics to monitor your progress towards meeting your next goal. So you could keep waiting for reviews to drip in, or you could open the floodgates with Podium. Just visit podium.com slash lawyerist to save 10% when you sign up. That's podium.com slash lawyerist to get started and save 10%. Podium, become the number one law office online. Unlock your productivity with Text Expander. Easily insert text snippets in any application from a library of content created by you and your team while reducing errors. You can save so much time, it's like getting an extra employee. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, and iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. There's more to answering a phone call than just pronouncing your name correctly. And I think that's what sets Ruby apart from all the other receptionist services out there. I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of people who work at Ruby, and from top to bottom, it's full of the kind of people you'd love to spend time with. I guess it's something in the coffee they serve. And after all, when someone calls your firm, that means they are going to be spending time with your receptionist. You may think you get to make a first impression when you pick up the phone, but that's not how it works. Maybe your receptionist is just on the call for a minute or two, but that's all it takes to form a first impression. So it's a good idea to make sure your receptionist is the kind of person you'd want your callers to spend time with. It could be the difference between a big case and a big fail. Don't worry, Ruby can handle pronouncing your name right. They'll also help you make a great first impression. And now Ruby can even help you connect with clients right on your website with 24-7 live online chat. You can find out more about Ruby receptionists and how to make a great first impression at callruby.com slash lawyeristpod. So Matt, your book is a program for better storytelling, but maybe we can give people some basic tips. And I'm sure you talk about this regularly. So what are some of the ways that you start that conversation with people when you're trying to get them just to get over that first hump of being better storytellers? Well, some of it we've already talked about. What I always start with is the idea of what is a story. Mm -hmm. Most people assume that stories are stuff that happened to us over the course of time told chronologically. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you say, how was your weekend? Sometimes people start with, well, on Friday night, and I think, oh, God, <laughs> you know, they're just going to lay out their weekend for me. So a story is about a moment in our lives where we have a realization or transformation change over time, yeah. essentially. And like you said, we're looking for these moments, these singular moments of transformation. Those are the things that we hinge on. So while I start a novel, I'm starting a new novel actually this week, I always start at the beginning having sort of no idea where the ending's going to be because I'm making everything up. With storytelling, personal storytelling, I always start at the end. I always ask myself, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is going to be that moment of realization or transformation. It's going to be, I used to think this one thing, but then some stuff happened and now I think this thing. Now, that's not a story. That's, you know, sort of a pitch for a story, an elevator pitch. But that's what I start with. When you write that down every day. Yes, I do. The homework for life. Right. I do homework for life every day, which is just the process by which every day at the end of the day, I ask myself, if required to tell a story about my day to day, what would that story be? Even if the story is ultimately untellable, you know, nothing I would waste anyone's time with. I still force myself to find the most story worthy moment in my day and I write it down. I write it down very shortly in an Excel spreadsheet, you know, four or five sentences that summarize the moment at most. I believe in small, repeatable tasks that become routines and habits. And over the course of time, what happened is I discovered that if you do this every day, you will find more stories in your life than you can ever find the time to tell. And that has been repeated by thousands of people who now do homework for life with me. It's a very simple, life-changing process. It feels like a good exercise to do just period, whether or not you ever intend to tell stories, just recognizing the significance of your life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have a lot of people, I did a TED talk on it. So a lot of times people stumble on the TED talk, not really mm -hmm. looking for storytelling, but just for 
you know, life improvement. And even the non-storytellers tell me things like suddenly their life feels like it has more meaning. Suddenly their days feel longer, their years feel longer. You, you know, you you don't lose a week of your life and wonder where the hell did it go because you've got at least one moment mm -hmm. from every single day. And if you start doing it regularly, you'll discover that you have multiple moments from every day. And that's a wonderful thing too. Yeah. So recognizing what a story is, is pivotal. I get this. Like, I feel like this translates directly to coming up with your story of a case because that five second moment is going to be the five seconds that decide how this case comes down. That is the five seconds in which the judge or the jury is going to have to make a decision or your negotiating partner is going to have to decide how much money they want to put on the table or take off the table. So that makes a lot of sense to me. That's about the five seconds. And then you say, but that's obviously not where you start your story. You started at the opposite state. Right. So once you know what the end of your story is, the beginning of your story, which is often the most difficult place to find, what you do is you ask yourself, what is the opposite of the end of my story? Because if you have to reflect change over time, if you have to demonstrate that I was once one person, but now I am another, I once thought one thing, but now I think the other, the beginning of the story is the moment where you were thinking the other thing, the opposite thing. So, you know, if you discovered one day that, my gosh, the woman who I've been working with all, you know, for the last two years is the woman I want to marry, you need to begin your story where you weren't recognizing that in her, that mm -hmm. you were just seeing her as a as a person who you would never consider marrying. And then over time, you get to that new place. It's the same way movies operate. If you watch the first 15 minutes of every movie, just about every movie, you will know how the movie's going to end. You're not going to know the specificity in terms of how it's going to end. But if the movie opens with a man who is lonely and doesn't have any friends, you have to know at the end of that movie he's not going to be lonely anymore and he's going to have friends. It doesn't mean the movie's not going to be good or that you're not going to be entertained, but almost always that is the case. And I've so that's how we I've been trying to forget this information since you wrote it down so that I can enjoy movies. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> wife doesn't allow me to talk anymore during movies because I used to turn to her and say, oh, you know how this movie's going to end. And now she says you can't speak to me anymore during yeah. television shows too. <laughs> but that's how it works. I mean, I thought though you're, uh, when you were describing the five second moment in Jurassic Park, that was a good example of a lot of things, like what makes a good travel story, in fact, or a good dinosaur movie. But maybe you could tell us that, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm obsessed with this movie. It's my favorite thing to talk about. I'm so glad you brought it up because I feel like <laughs> no one ever wants to talk to me about this. I want to hear it. But if you see the first Jurassic Park movie... You go into it and you think that it's a movie about dinosaurs, but it's not in any way whatsoever. Really what it's about is a couple, two archaeologist people, who are romantically linked, but not sort of together completely. They're not married. There seems to be some question in the relationship. She actually allows the Ian Malcolm, the character played by Jeff Goldblum, to hit on her a little bit. It's mm -hmm. clear that they're not completely together. And the reason they're not together is because he doesn't like kids. And we find that out in almost the first scene of the movie. I think it's the second scene of the movie where he's digging up dinosaur bones and there's kids on the dig site. They shouldn't be there, but they're conveniently for the movie. And he's describing to this little boy about velociraptors and how they would eat him alive as he screamed and how they would sneak up on him and devour him. It's a really horrible way to talk to a child. And as they walk away from the child, the woman says to the man, why do you do that? You know, and he says, you want one of those things? And she says, I don't want that kid. But yeah, I'd like kids. And that's it. That's what the movie's about. It's a man who doesn't want kids who happens to be with a woman who wants kids. And if you watch the film, surprisingly or not surprisingly, what happens is the man who doesn't want to have kids ends up in Jurassic Park with two kids mm -hmm. trying to keep them alive throughout the entire movie. And if you track the movie really carefully, you'll watch how those kids will slowly grow on that doctor until the end of the movie is not really the end of the movie. The end of the movie happens in a tree. It's nighttime and he's got the two kids. They're still sort of trying to get out of Jurassic Park, but they've climbed a tree for the night to sleep. And he's got both kids in his arms and the boy makes him laugh and he pulls him in because he's a jokester and the boy falls asleep on his shoulder. And the girl, she looks at him and she says, you know, what if the bad dinosaurs come back? And he says, don't worry, I'm going to stay up all night. And she says, all night. And he says, yes. And he pulls her <laughs> in closer. He can't be holding these children closer. That's yeah. it. That's the movie. The man has learned to love children and now he can be with the woman he wants to be with. But if I had asked you, hey, do you want to go see a movie 
about a man who can't fundamentally be with the woman he loves because he doesn't want to have kids and she does, you would not want to see that movie. Right. It's a nice story that has been told a million times. Right. But Steven Spielberg says, hey, I'm going to take that great story and I'm going to put it in a dinosaur park. <laughs> and so the dinosaurs get you to come to the movie. But the reason you end up leaving that movie and thinking that was a good movie, it's not because of the dinosaurs, because dinosaur movies have been made before and will be made again. It's because when you leave, you understand that something important has happened, even if you didn't actually notice it happening. Your heart and your mind understand that something meaningful has taken place and you can feel good about it. So and my understanding, too, uh, in trying to connect a few dots in your book is that that story is the backbone but the dinosaurs raise the stakes because he might get eaten, right? Like it's great and all that he loves kids now, but he may get eaten before he has a chance to get back to Ellie Sattler and propose to her or something. Yes, absolutely. I mean, stakes are critical in a story. Stakes are the reason why we want to hear the next sentence mm -hmm. of a story. And so in that movie, dinosaurs are the stakes. Dinosaurs are the reason that we are paying attention because at any moment, someone can be eaten and people are getting eaten all the time. <laughs> right now, we should know who's going to be eaten, though, of course. Like in any movie like this, the man there who carries... There it's a story. <laughs> right. Like whoever carries a gun the most will absolutely die. And so, of course, the hunter gets killed because he carries a gun very often. Anyone who does anything bad is going to die. In that movie... Samuel L. Jackson dies, and I'm convinced he dies because he's smoking the whole movie. Yeah. And so, you know, these are the people you should be able to identify. If we're going to have to kill off anyone, we're going to kill off the guy with the gun and the smoker and anyone who does anything nefarious in any way. We know the kids aren't going to die. We know the two doctors aren't going to die. You know, the owner of the park is really the only one up for grabs, whether he's going to die or not. And I bet Spielberg, if you asked him, he said he went both ways. He was, wasn't sure in the end which way to go. <laughs> and it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> well, actually, what I fundamentally figured out was the kids are related to the owner of the park. Oh. They're like his grandchildren, I think. And I just don't think you can have the kids watch granddad get eaten by a dinosaur. And so that's why he gets to live. And every other Jurassic Park movie, the owner of the park absolutely dies because he's not related to anyone we care about. <laughs> Total non sequitur, but I just remembered that my daughter left her blood on the Jurassic Park ride at Universal Studios. And, and maybe that plays in here somewhere, too. But she, <laughs> she will be turned into a dinosaur. Someday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the things you talk about in the book, too, is humor. And humor is always it is controversial. And I suppose it depends on where and how you're using it. But. Lots of us are telling stories in order to make people laugh. And I think the way you talk about humor is that that is not the function of humor in a story. Yes, correct. You know, humor has a great place in storytelling. And if you're doing stand up, I'm doing stand up tonight. Mm -hmm. My goal is not to tell a story. It's just to make people laugh every 15 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a story, when I'm storytelling, I deploy it strategically. And so humor is used to. Uh, get the audience on your side to get them to like you and trust you, because if you can make someone laugh early on in a story, you've sort of proven yourself to be someone worth listening to. You become endearing to them. Humor can sort of smooth out boring moments in a story, those moments where I have to convey information that is impossible to make exciting in any way. If I can make it funny, though, I can trick people into listening to boring stuff you know, while my story continues in the same way in was it the big short? There was a moment where a lot of financial information had to be disclosed. Mm. And so the way they did it is they had a half naked woman in a hot tub disclose <laughs> that information. That was essentially <laughs> the same thing. It was the acknowledgement that you need to know a lot of stuff that is not very interesting. But if we put it in a hot tub and we take her clothes off, it's going to be more interesting. Yeah. It raises the stakes as well, because if you just put any naked person in a hot tub, immediately the stakes are, is that person going to stand up? Mm. Am I going to end up seeing that person <laughs> naked? No, but uh, very, no, that's very a super true. good point. That's really funny. I'd never stopped to consider that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a storyteller, I am ruthless. I ask myself of my stories and other people's stories, if I just stopped talking now, would anyone care? Yeah. And if I'm listening to stories on a podcast and the storyteller has been speaking for a minute and I am not wondering about anything or concerned or worried or excited about the next sentence, I just stop listening. I have a finite amount of time and there are too many good stories in the world. So if you don't get me wondering about the next sentence, I'm not going to listen. And so 
put naked people in a hot tub and we will wonder the whole time whether they're going to stand up or not. Even if they don't, the wondering is enough to keep us watching. And that's what humor does. Humor is enough to keep us watching until we get to the parts that are actually exciting, interesting, you know, noteworthy. While you were talking, that totally reminded me of another piece that really resonated with me, which is the cinema of the mind idea that in order to keep someone listening, there are a number of different tools. But one of the things that you talk about is everything in your story, it should take place in a place, right? I should be able to, I should be imagining the setting or it's not a story, then it's an essay. Yes, that is the thing that in the work I've done with attorneys is the thing that has resounded the most mm -hmm. with them in terms of speaking to people and getting them to see what they want them to see. And it's a simple trick of uh, present a physical location to your audience at all times. Mm -hmm. I believe that, like we brought up Jurassic Park, I believe that the stories we tell are just movies that we create in the minds of our audience. And if you're a filmmaker, when you're shooting a film, you always have a place that you're pointing the camera at, you know, whether it's a living room or a jungle or a cityscape, the actors are always standing somewhere. And so when I'm telling a story about my life, I always need to let the audience know where I am standing, what place I am in. And because I provide a place, now I have a scene and the audience can kind of forget where they are and who they are. They can really start to see my story in their mind's eye and even forget themselves. You know, when we watch a movie like Titanic and we cry at the end of the movie because Jack dies and, you know, Rose lives, mm -hmm. right? There's a part of our brain that has forgotten who we are because we also know that's Leonardo DiCaprio and he made $10 million to hang around in that pool of water somewhere on Universal and Studios. And there's totally room on that thing for him. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and, and they kind of don't, they don't love each other. In fact, I heard they kind of didn't get along. And he's not <laughs> dead because he's going to be in that next movie, that, you know, that Inception movie in six months. It's like, <laughs> why am I crying about two people who I know are just pretending to be other people who never actually existed ever? Right. But our brains sort of forget who we are when it comes to storytelling. We fall into it. And so when we tell stories where we provide settings where we are, we can cause the mind to see those things and forget the other things around us. And then we can fall into the story. And that's how I make people cry at the end of stories quite often, you know, because I'm telling them something that happened 26 years ago mm -hmm. that should not affect them in any way because it barely affects me now. It's 26 <laughs> years old. And yet we're all crying over it, including me sometimes, because I forget who I am and where I am because I go back to that time, too. But it's the simplest trick in the world that at all times your audience should be able to tell you exactly where you are. And in doing that, you can also harness the imagination of your audience, which is more powerful than any words you will ever say. So if I just say, I'm staring at a mountain in the middle of New Hampshire, I just created an image in your mind, and I don't even need to use an adjective to refine that image unless I need to, unless there needs to be right, snow I'll on the mountain. Yeah. They will, yeah, and unless, unless the details are relevant to the story in some way, I don't use adjectives either. I just say there's a mountain in New Hampshire. I've created a perfect image in your mind, exactly what I want you to see. Your imagination is just going to do a better job than I ever will be able to do with words myself. And I suppose the reason that that comes in so handy with lawyers is because if I want to persuade, I have to create empathy, right? I have to create a connection and I need to make you understand my position and my client's position and I can do that intellectually with numbers and figures and facts and laws, or I can also employ the tool of getting you to put yourself in my client's shoes, and I can only do that by locating you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I had a school board member call me once. He was trying to get a program cut in our school district, a program that he did not like. He, he felt, let's move the money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. He did research and collected data for a year put together a wonderful PowerPoint, went to the Board of Ed meeting, presented it, and it was wonderful. And then one woman got up and told a story about how the program had helped her son, and he lost the vote. And he called me afterwards, and he said, I always lose to the anecdote. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, you took a PowerPoint to a meeting to convince people. I said, you took a knife to a gunfight. She had a story, like a story will crush you every time because a story will get that empathy, that connection, it will get people to trust you. And I always say, once I can tell people stories, I can get them to do almost anything. 
And so, you know, if you watch me do a TED talk, I do a bunch of them. Oftentimes, I just want to convey a message. Mm -hmm. I want to give people an idea. But I always open with a story that is related to the message. Because once they like me, once they know me, once they feel connected to me through a story, I can get them to think the way I want them to think. Same thing in teaching. When I'm working with 10-year-olds, I tell stories all day long. I need to teach them long division. But what I really need to do is to get them to listen to me, love me, trust me, and then I'll teach them long division because they're going to be on the boat with me. They're going to be with me and pulling those oars just as hard as I'm pulling. So while you're talking, it was making me reflect on the fact that politicians always tell these pandering stories about their constituents, which made me reflect on in your book, you make it very clear that you don't get to tell other people's stories. Right. But when isn't that a conflict when it comes to lawyers? Like, isn't our job to tell other people's stories? How do you do that? Well? Yeah, well, it's tricky. One of the things I actually did with lawyers was rather than teaching the lawyers to tell stories, we got together with their witnesses mm. and I taught lawyers how to teach witnesses to tell stories. Huh. And so that way you got people in the courtroom telling their own stories for you. And that was very helpful. But if you're going to tell someone else's story, the problem is when you tell someone else's story, you don't express any vulnerability. Right. It's easy for me to tell my grandmother's story, you know, who is now passed. There's no risk for me. You're not going to feel more connected to me because you know my grandmother. But the way I do it is a trick I learned from actually a couple of podcasts that deal with this kind of issue with history. The way I will tell someone else's story is I think about it in terms of the camera angle and I will speak in terms of the camera. So I say things like um, I marry people. <laughs> I'm a I'm a minister. Mm -hmm. And now that they know I'm a storyteller, they often ask me, can you tell a story about us? at the ceremony, which is annoying, but I'm willing to do it. <laughs> so I just did a wedding recently and the couple had walked out onto a frozen reservoir together and the ice was thin and they fell through and they essentially saved each other's lives. Hmm. And it was a beautiful story. And the way I told it was, I said things like, I want you to see a couple standing on the edge of a frozen reservoir. There's snow on the ground and they're dressed in warm coats. It's a frigid day. Can you see them? They're holding hands. They love each other. They take that first precarious step onto the reservoir. The ice cracks, but it holds. It's fine. There's kids already out on the reservoir skating. It's a frigid day. They begin their walk. I want you to see them walking step by step. They're six months away from being married. They're talking about their upcoming wedding. And now I want you to hear the first big crack of the ice. And I go through it like that. Mm. And so I'm able to at least direct the audience's gaze and force them to see things rather than sort of speaking in the third person and saying, one day Jane and John went down to the reservoir, right? I want them to like laser focus their eyes, their minds, their ears on only the things that I want them to hear and see and feel. Because directing focus is really key. Like you talk about sometimes you eliminate characters from that were there in real life from your stories because you don't want the audience to be sitting with that third wheel. You want them to be in the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I say as storytellers, we tell the truth, but we never tell the whole truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never added anything into a story that didn't actually happen but I'm ripping things out of stories all the time that don't serve the purpose of the story. And so, yes, the only difference is if I'm telling a story about myself, I'm always speaking about myself in mm -hmm. the first person. When I'm speaking about other people, I'm speaking in the second person. I'm using that you. I want you to see this. I want you to see this rather than I see this and I see that. And when I'm telling a personal story, I'm trying to get the audience to see the world through my eyes as I am a character in the story. When I'm telling stories about other people, I'm trying to get them to see through the camera lens that I am pointing at the story. Right, you're hovering like just above and behind the protagonists in the story. Exactly. Yes. Uh, you've alluded to this. I think I mentioned it earlier, but you have taught storytelling to lawyers. Is there anything that we've not covered that you bring to those trainings when you are teaching other lawyers how to tell stories? You know, I guess the most interesting thing for me has been the idea that storytelling outside the courtroom can be just as important as storytelling inside the courtroom. Uh, so I've worked with attorneys who want to be able to tell their clients what it's going to be like once they get into court mm -hmm. because they want them to be prepared. I guess clients can be difficult. Yeah, <laughs> actually, sometimes. I was arrested. I was arrested and tried for a crime I did not commit. So I was actually on trial and I was a difficult client. I remember my attorney turning to me and saying, stop talking until I tell you to speak. Hmm. So I've had attorneys who I've worked with just to help them so that they can tell the story 
of what will happen in the courtroom to the client right. in a way that the client will now understand and be a uh, effective ally in the courtroom. But if they don't have a sense, cause they've just never done this before, oftentimes it's their first time, you know, in this role, if you can't really tell a good story and project a good image of what to expect, that's going to be hard for them. And I, I did feel that the work that I did helping lawyers teach storytelling to witnesses was highly effective, both in terms of getting them to convey what is going to be needed to be conveyed in the courtroom, but mm -hmm. also by teaching people to tell stories, you manage to find information that you would not have normally found. Right. You know, as we were working with these people, suddenly things came up. And I remember the attorneys getting very excited. They were like, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you can get someone speaking about their life and feeling good about the way it's coming out and having some strategies to make it sound good, they're going to be much more willing to share. And so they managed to not only get effective storytellers into the courtroom on their behalf, but to find more information through the process of that storytelling. And we're always worried about our witnesses rambling and talking about irrelevant stuff. But in the process of teaching them to tell stories is more about teaching them to be effective and give the relevant details and only the relevant details in the most effective way. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And if you get them to understand why sort of we're leaving that third wheel out of the story, mm -hmm. you know, if, if they understand, oh, in storytelling, a third wheel is just going to clutter the landscape mm -hmm. of your story and distract people. Yes, I agree. We should definitely take my cousin out of the story, even though she was there that day. <laughs> right. She didn't play a role. So once you get them to understand some of these principles of storytelling, they feel better about yeah. going into the courtroom. They feel more prepared. You know, for a person like me who might have to go in and sit on the stand and speak to people, it's better to feel like I know what I'm doing and I'm going to be at least interesting to the jury. I'm going to provide the information that is required to the judge, those kinds of things. Confidence plays a huge role. That makes sense. I am tempted to ask you to tell us a story as if I'm a seven-year-old, but instead I'm going to direct people to your YouTube channel, Story Worthy, the book, where they can see you telling a number of stories at Moth Story Slams. I think that's probably better than asking me to put you on the spot. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Uh, but there are stories there, you're right. You can also find, I, I have a YouTube channel just with my name, Matthew Dix, okay. and there's many, many stories there too. The Story Worthy YouTube channel has stories that apply directly to the book, but you can see even more on my primary YouTube channel. Very cool. Matthew Dix, thanks so much for being with us today and telling us stories about storytelling. Thank you very much. It was a great opportunity and I always appreciate the chance to talk about stories. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Mm -hmm.